I think the the first thing is, you know, when they're disruptors like COVID, it opens opportunities. Um, people shouldn't sit down and say, oh, this is tragic and terrible. Um, if you're a proper entrepreneur, you say, hang on, there must be an opportunity that this is creating. Um, so I've got a factory down in Cape Town. We ended up making parts for of respirators because we have the manufacturing capability. Um, so it was just a case of finding the right people. Um, Rainer Gabler, who runs Gabler Medical down in Cape Town, who's a SARMED member and is on the SARMED board, um, his company also saw this as an opportunity um, and they started manufacturing items that were needed for respirators, etc. Um, so I think that's the first thing. It, it, when there's a disruptor, it energizes the people who've got a little bit of go in them and the other people sit back and do nothing. And they, um, for example, in the UK, my sales force realized that uh, they could get out there if they became mask fitters. There was a thing that, that you could train to become a fitter of a, risk, of a mask. Um, and that enabled you to get a permit to be on the road where everybody else had to stay behind. So all the opposition companies' reps sat in their homes and they got bailouts from government to sit back and do nothing. Um, our guys all got these licenses to be on the road um, and we all of a sudden gained tons of new customers during COVID. Um, so in fact, our sales never dropped, they actually went up. Australia ran out of product um, and we picked up a whole lot of new customers because we had enough product in Australia when the big companies sort of couldn't get their product to, well, they had to close their factories down because of the rules in those European countries. Um, so I think one's always got to say, just look for the opportunity. Um, there's always something there. Um, what it's done is it's changed the mindset to people wanting to do local manufacture. All, all over the world. Um, people are a little bit worried now about importing everything from China or whatever because they know that it actually can, can immobilize you. So I think the, it's created a great opportunity in this country for people to say, hang on, we better do some local manufacture. Um, and I think um, with my hat as, as SAMED, um, we've got these multinationals. Um, and you know, the thing that people don't realize is that they actually are big selling organizations. They, they don't worry too much about who makes it and where it's made. Um, and you can go and partner with them. And you can go to the Medtronics, the J&Js, the, the bigger companies, and you can go and say to them, you know, this product that you import how about us making it for you? Um, it's a much quicker way to get into it than to try and start up like I did, because then you, you're into you know, looking 10, 20 years ahead um, before you will develop a reputation for your product. Um, with medical devices, it's very brand specific. People want to, you're putting stuff into somebody's body, um, there's a huge resistance to doing it with something brand new, with, some, with a company that hasn't got a reputation. Um, a reputation is an in, enormous factor. So there, if you partner with somebody who's already got a reputation and has already got a sales force out there, it's the only quick way to get into it. To do it from grassroots yourself, you you into looking 30 years ahead. So anybody in the audience who's older than sort of 40, then you might as well go. Because this, <laughs> you, you can't really get stuff going um, very quickly with medical devices. And as you said, it's the, it's the regulatory environment, it's the building of a reputation, um, and those are really lifetimes of work um, that are in it. There's no quick fix to doing that. So the quick way is to partner with people who've already got the market and know how the market works um, and to do the manufacturing for them um, would be the, the, the quick way to get into it. 
Um, and as an example, we, we manufacture for one of our opposition companies, the biggest dental implant company in the world, which is based in Switzerland. Um, they've got the market, they've got the people all over the world, um, and we manufacture a product for them. Um, and that is probably the, the better way to start thinking about getting into it. Um, you then do that and then you learn all the tricks of the trade along the way and then you can get into making your own product line, etc. Um, when you've established that. Um, to go from the start and just say, well, I'm going to go out and make this new product, etc. That's great and that's what I did. But you need 30 years probably to, to really let it get to fruition. Um, so the investors in my company initially were family and friends. Um, and for 15 years, they got absolutely nothing because, and they were happy because they knew that there was going to be something coming. But investment agencies obviously aren't very happy to wait 15 years. Um, and that's one of the difficulties that there is there. So think of you know the timelines that these things take. Um, and then of course our biggest problem is, you know, South Africa is not known as a medical device manufacturing country. Um, and when you talk to people, they sort of say, where, from where does this come? From Africa, you know? Um, whereas if you go and you say it's made in Germany or it's made in Switzerland, it's much easier because people expect product, high quality product that you're gonna implant in patients to come from those sort of countries. So you've got this enormous barrier that Africa is not known as a place to make high quality medical devices. And we've got to, we, I hope we're gonna change that, um, but it's gonna take years and years and years to, to get that change. Um, we are known as a place that can make guns and artillery weapons, etc. Um, but we're not really known as a place that can make high-level medical devices. Um, in the beginning, I used to trade on the fact that, oh, the first heart transplant was done in Cape Town, etc. cetera. Um, but now people, you know, it's so long ago, it doesn't really count anymore. Um, the other thing that does help us a little bit is if your university medical schools are very active and are publishing and are doing that. And unfortunately, our rate of publication from our universities has been going down one way, um, which, which also doesn't help. But when I started, we, we had wonderful research going on at, at WITS, Tuckies, etc., cetera, um, which was helping to raise the profile that, hang on, there's stuff going on in this country that is good. Um, and, uh, you know, so what do we have to do? We've got to get to those medical schools and we've got to tell them, you know, come on guys, let's do this properly um, and get people motivated to do the research and to get it going. Um, and, uh, and, and that's also another critical component. So right at the moment, that's an impediment. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, we need, to, we need to get it going. So where does most of my research now come from? It actually comes, unfortunately, from universities out, outside of South Africa, um, simply because the, the guys that were here doing the research have started retiring, etc., and they haven't passed it on to the next generation correctly. Um, and, and that does limit us. You have to do trials, you have to do clinical trials, and sometimes they insist on you doing it in their country, not in your country. But the more you can do here, we, we're busy with a product at the moment that we're hoping that our trials in South Africa are going to count and that they're going to accept the results so that we don't have to go and repeat those trials in another country. Um, but it's always on a case-by-case -case basis. 